Okay. Um, on behalf of the Committee on Stochastic Programming, it is once again my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to our uh, webinar series, Decision Making in an Uncertain World. Um, I'm Guzim Bayraksan from The Ohio State University. Um, I would again like to thank my colleagues on the Committee of Stochastic Programming for making this uh, a series of, um, you know, uh, a reality. And today we have uh, a wonderful speaker. Uh, we're very excited to have Danielle Kuhn from uh, EFPL. Uh, I'll try to pronounce it, but uh, I'm afraid, Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> from Switzerland. And he's currently the chair of risk analytics and optimization. Um, and before joining EFPL, he was a faculty member at the Imperial College London and a postdoc uh, researcher at Stanford. And um, he's very well known um, um, in the area of, of obviously stochastic programming, robust optimization and distributionally robust optimization. And uh, he is uh, currently the area editor of optimization, I believe continuous optimization in the journal operations research. And he's also an associate editor on um, several other uh, top journals like management science, mathematical programming, mathematics of operations research, uh, OI letters. And he's also the former chair of the uh, Stochastic Programming Society uh, last three years, 2016 to 19. Uh, and uh, we thank him for his service to the society as well. Um, today he will be talking about um, uh, learning from correlated data and uh, with uh, moder moderate deviations theory to distribution robust optimization. Um, but before we start his talk, we ask our speakers as usual, what is their uh, view of or approach to uh, decision making in an uncertain world? And so after, uh, relatively short answer to this, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear the talk. Go ahead, Daniel. Thank you very much, Christine, for the kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, Kost very much for the invitation to give this seminar. OK, so you asked me, what's your um, approach to decision making under uncertainty? And uh, I think I can give a very short answer. So I try not to have a particular approach to decision making under uncertainty, but to embrace many different approaches, uh, depending on the, the problem at hand, and actually to try to find always new approaches uh, that have maybe not been used before to decision-making under uncertainty. So in fact, um, in this talk, I would like to um, use a particular method, which is moderate deviation sphere, which to, to my knowledge has not been uh, used a lot um, in, in the context of, of decision-making. Okay, so, so this talk um, addresses uh, data-driven optimization and control, but in contrast to much of the existing literature, what we do is we will abandon the standard assumption that the data is IID. I should say that this is joint work with my postdoc Tobias Sutra and with my PhD students Bart Riomini and uh, Soru Shafiezade Abade. Okay, so specifically what I would like to do in this talk, I would like to consider linear quadratic regulator problems. Um, so where some of the problem parameters need to be learned from serially correlated state observations. So the central object of study in uh, LQR problems is a dynamical systems, system. Um, you can think of this as a quadrocopter or a chemical plant or a power system or investment portfolio. Now, we assume that the dynamics of the state is linear. So this means that the state at time t plus one is a linear function of the state at time t, the control action at time t, and some exogenous noise. We also assume that we um, have knowledge of the initial state distribution, which is denoted by mu. So the objective of an LQR problem is to find a sequence of control actions that may only depend on past state observations and that minimize the long run average of some convex quadratic cost function. So this cost function, the first term here, incentivizes the controller to drive the state to zero um, and and the, the underlying assumption that zero is the least costly and thus most desirable state uh, can be made essentially without loss of generality. The second term can be interpreted as the effort that is associated with the control actions. So the huge success of the LQR problems is largely based on the insight that 
the optimal controllers are actually linear. So more precisely, the uh, optimal action can be expressed as some matrix K, which is the feedback gain matrix multiplied by the current state. So now we substitute our linear controller back into the, into the dynamics. Um, I do not necessarily assume that the controller we're looking at is the optimal one, just some uh, linear controller. We know that among those, there is the optimal one. So we fix one K. If we do that, then um, we obtain the so-called closed loop dynamics. In the following, we don't denote the matrix that multiplies the state at time, uh, at time t. So this matrix A plus B times K. We um, refer to it as the system matrix, and I'm going to denote it by theta. So what we have seen is that under a linear controller, the state now follows a first-order autoregressive process. And it's clear that different linear controllers result in different system matrices theta. So in this talk, we will restrict attention to controllers for which the system matrix, for which this theta is stable. And that means that all of its eigenvalues should have absolute values that are strictly smaller than one. Here's an example of a two by two system matrix, um, which is stable because both of its eigenvalues are 0 0.95 and are therefore um, strictly smaller than, than one. So let's maybe use ellipsoids to visualize the covariance matrix of the state distribution. The gray ellipsoid here is a visualization of the initial state distribution mu. Now, as time progresses, um, the state distribution spreads out, uh, in this case, because both eigenvalues of the system matrix are close to one, and eventually stabilizes in the invariant state distribution. So it stabilizes asymptotically in this case. Now, let's perturb our system matrix a bit such that one of the eigenvalues becomes, uh, has an absolute value that's strictly larger than one, so 0 0.12. And in this case, if you start from the same initial distribution, then we can actually see that eventually the variance diverges in the direction of the left eigenvector corresponding to this unstable eigenvalue. Okay, we don't want that to happen, and for that reason, we focus on stable system matrices. Now, we're given a controller and the corresponding system matrix. The quality of that controller is often measured by some performance function, which I don't by J. And this is a function of the system matrix theta induced by our controller. And as we've seen before, the, the most typical example is perhaps the performance um, of a performance performance function is the average, the long run average cost. Um, and here actually, I should point out that the expectation is taken with respect to some probability measure P theta under which the state obeys the linear dynamics, the closed loop dynamics shown above. But this is not the, the only example of interest. Other performance functions are, for example, the um, asymptotic state variance or the spectral radius of the system matrix. Okay, so very important. What I would like to assume during the talk is that the system matrix theta is actually not known to us. This is the case if the matrices A and B that appeared in the original linear dynamics are unknown, um, and the theta is then unknown even if the feedback gain matrix K is known to us. Um, okay, so our goal is now to learn the performance function J of theta without knowing theta, but by observing a sequence of states that are generated by this first order autoregressive process with the unknown theta. So more specifically, what I would like to do is I would like to um, derive efficiently computable confidence bound on this performance uh, function. And this is challenging because the observed states, they are serially correlated. It's an autoregressive process. So, and what we actually do is we see this cons uh, the construction of such confidence bounds as an important step towards a rigorous theory of reinforcement learning. So that's the goal. Now let's look at an example. Let's assume we would like to control the Hubble Space Telescope. So more precisely, we would like to point the telescope to a particular patch of sky so that we can take a beautiful picture of the Eagle Nebula, for example. Now changing the telescope's direction could cause vibrations. And these vibrations, in turn, could damage the telescope if too extreme. Now, the telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, costs $1.5 billion. 
and uh, therefore actually such damage should be avoided by all means. So in a simplified two-dimensional model, the state of the telescope can be described by its angle to the target direction, theta here, and its angular velocity. And if the angle theta is actually not too large, then the dynamics of the state are, is approximately linear. So the first goal is to point the telescope to the right direction. And we will achieve this by implementing a particular controller that drives the angle to zero. Now this controller may be constructed from a mathematical model of the telescope. And this mathematical model may not exactly correspond to the very complicated real system. And that means that the system matrix corresponding to that controller is actually uh, not known to us precisely. The second goal is to mitigate vibrations. Now, under our controller, the state follows this first order of the autoregressive process. And actually, the, the noise term here um, uh, is uh, uh, represents actually thermally induced vibrations by the, the solar panels. Okay? So this is admittedly a somewhat um, stylized model of the, the Hubble Space Telescope. However, the problem with the thermal vibrations is an, an absolutely a real one that has even made the headlines. For example, the New York Times at some point wrote that troubles continue to plague orbiting Hubble Telescope. Or the Baltimore Sun, which is not a newspaper I know, uh, wrote that vibrations from power supply mean more trouble for Hubble. And also in the New Scientist, there was a headline saying that Hubble picking up bad vibrations. So this is a real problem. In a, but in, in this case, admittedly, in a stylized model. So the severity of the vibrations, they can conveniently be captured by the long run asymptotic variance of the state. And it is thus reasonable to set the performance function, say, of theta to this long run state variance. Okay. So what we would like to achieve is to verify in a rigorous statistical sense, whether the controller that we apply um, leads to vibrations that remain below a certain safety threshold that prevent damage to the telescope. And in order to do this, make this decision, we only have access to a finite trajectory of correlated states generated under, under our control. So we have only this one trajectory so that means we have only one attempt and we should better not fail because, as I said before, the telescope is worth $1.5 billion. Okay, so let's go back to the general problem. And now in general, even if you have very little knowledge about system matrix theta, a sort of a minimal assumption is that we need, uh, uh, minimal assumption that we need to make is that this matrix is stable. And as I said before, the matrix is stable if the largest eigenvalue modulus is strictly smaller than one. So to write the talk, I'm going to denote the set of stable matrices by capital theta. I would like to emphasize that this assumption is indeed minimal because most common performance functions, they are infinite for um, uh, unstable system matrices. And uh, this is actually certainly true for the long run state variance, which blows up as we've seen before, for unstable system matrices. Um, okay. So, however, this set of stable matrices is a nasty one. It is non-convex, it's unbounded and open. So it's not a nice thing from the point of view of optimization. So here's a visualization, a 2D um, uh, slice of the, the set of all stable two by two matrices, where we fix the diagonal elements to one half. And so we can now see that the set of all uh, off-diagonal elements that make this matrix stable is non-convex and it also extends to infinity along the coordinate axis. And also this set is, is actually open. The reason for that is that the largest eigenvalue modulus is a continuous function of the system matrix theta. And in the definition here, we require that this continuous function is strictly smaller than one. And so actually in the same example, here's a visualization of the long run state variance for diff different system matrices, okay? So you can see that as expected, this uh, asymptotic state variance actually 
uh, tends to infinity as theta approaches the boundary of the set of stable matrices. And uh, that actually means that the sublevel sets of this function for high levels, they start more and more to look like um, the red set of stable matrices, which is non-connect. Okay, so this function is clearly very non-connect as well. And that's one example of our performance functions we would like to study. Okay, so with this in mind, I'm now ready to state the, um, the abstract goal of this talk. So what I would like to do, um, given a finite sequence of correlated state observations, I would like to construct two, estimator, two estimators, lowercase j hat and capital J hat, that display the following desir desirable properties. So first of all, the two estimators should provide upper and lower confidence bounds on the unknown true performance function, j of theta, for some prescribed small significance level beta. Second, these estimators should be asymptotically consistent. And uh, by that I mean that they should converge almost surely um, to the true performance function as the amount of data increases. And that just means that these estimators should improve as we collect more state observations. And the first, uh, certainly not least important uh, properties that is that of tractability. So it should be easy to compute these two estimators or otherwise um, they wouldn't be very useful in practice. Okay, so that's the goal. Now let me first sketch a naive approach how we could try to derive confidence bounds. This naive approach would proceed by first trying to estimate the unknown state matrix from the observed history of states. Um, in fact, what I propose here is to, to use the, the least squares estimator, which is obtained by regressing the state at time t plus one to the state at time t. So here's the formula. Now from the theory of ordinary, ordinary least squares, it's known that asymptotically for large t, uh, this estimator is normally distributed and therefore has elliptical confidence sets. Okay, so for a prescribed significance level beta, what we could now do is we could construct an, an ellipsoid script E centered at the estimator, the least squares estimator, uh, such that we're guaranteed that the unknown true system matrix is inside that ellipsoid with um, probability at least one minus beta. So once we have such an ellipsoid, we could then construct lower and upper confidence bounds on the unknown performance function. Uh, this could be done conveniently by minimizing and maximizing the, the actual performance function over this confidence ellipsoid. And of course, the resulting estimators would have the property that the unknown true performance function is bracketed by them with the desired probability. So this would be a very uh, simple approach to get estimators. Now, I'd like to argue that, however, this may be uh, too simple to be used. So we have seen that most relevant performance functions, they will be, they're infinite outside the set of stable matrices. Now, if the observed state trajectory is not sufficiently long, then the confidence ellipsoid may extend beyond the set theta of stable matrices. And if we maximize uh, to get the upper confidence bound over this ellipsoid, then the maximum would be plus infinity. So our upper confidence bound would actually be plus infinity. And of course, this is a trivial upper confidence bound that is useless in practice. I should emphasize that intersecting the confidence ellipsoid here in the optimization problems with the set theta of stable matrices would not solve the problem because um, the performance functions we're interested in, they already um, tend to infinity as we, all, as we only approach the boundary of the set of stable matrices from the inside. So this would not work. So we need a more subtle approach to derive confidence bounds. So that's what I would like to propose now. So that's what we will do in this talk. The key tool that we will use to derive non-trivial confidence bounds is a so-called moderate deviations principle. Okay, so here is basically the definition of, of such a moderate deviations principle. Now look at the sequence of estimators, theta hat t, which are indexed by the length of the uh, state trajectory that is available to us. So we say that these estimators satisfy a moderate deviations principle if there is a rate function i, um, which can be seen as a sort of a, a distance measure between 
estimate your realizations theta hat and stable system matrices theta uh, such that the following inequalities are satisfied for all, all Borel sets D uh, in the space of possible estimate realizations. Okay, so now these two inequalities that need to hold, they're a bit difficult to, to, to parse. So let's try to do that together, step by step. So let's first look at the minimization problems on the right-hand side. What these problems do is they fix some system matrix that is stable and they try to minimize the distance of the set D to this uh, matrix with respect to the rate function I. Okay. Um, actually, the first problem optimizes, so tries to find the distance to the interior of D, the, the other problem to the closure of D, but for uh, sets D that we're typically will encounter in, in applications, uh, these two minimization problems will have the same optimal value. So let's just call this one R, the rate. Now, the limits on the left-hand side, they can be seen as the exponential decay rate of the probability that the estimator theta hat t falls inside the set d. Now, if the number of state observations t is large, we can basically, for simplicity, just forget about the limits, multiply the square root of t to the other side and take uh, the exponential on both sides. And then what these inequalities tell us essentially is that the probability that the estimator at, uh, based on t state observations, we fall into the set D is approximately equal to e to the minus r times the square root of t. And uh, here the probability is taken with respect to the probability measure under which the states follow this first order of progressive uh, process with state uh, system matrix theta. So that's the formula that I think is more understandable and that's what we should keep in mind. So the rate function i determines at what rate this probability decays. Now we will use such a moderate deviations principle to derive confidence bounds on the performance function. And um, we will actually be working with the least squares estimators I've introduced before. But unfortunately, these least squares estimators themselves, they do not satisfy a moderate deviations principle. However, it is known that some shifted and scaled, rescaled least squares estimators, as shown by this formula here, they do satisfy a moderate deviations principle with a sum rate function that is not known explicitly, but that is known in variational form. So that's where we start. Now, what we managed to prove is that this rate function actually admits a quasi-closed form representation, as shown here, as the trace um, as some trace that involves the inverse of the, um, the covariance matrix of the, of the noise and that involves some matrix S theta, which is the unique positive definite solution of this Lyapunov equation here. Actually, this matrix S theta can be shown to be equal to the asymptotic covariance matrix of the state of our system when it runs under theta. Okay. So this explicit rate function we're going to use to construct estimators. Now, let me first mention some of the properties of this rate function. First of all, one can show that it vanishes if theta is equal to theta prime and otherwise it's strictly positive. So that means it behaves as we would expect from a distance function. It is also analytic, that means it's infinitely often differentiable. And it diverges as the maximum, the largest eigenvalue modulus um, converges to one. So this rate function tends to infinity as theta becomes unstable. It's also convex quadratic in theta prime. So theta prime is the estimator realization, but it's non-convex in theta and therefore it's not a symmetric uh, distance measure. And we can also show that this um, function is coercive in theta. That means um, all sublevel sets are, are bounded. So actually, if the state is simply one dimensional, then the space of all stable matrices is equivalent to the set of all scalars between minus one and one. And however, the least squares estimators may still take any value in R. And in this simple case, this rate function um, simplifies to a rational function as shown here. And the, the asymptotic state covariance matrix also admits uh, an expression as a 
as a simple rational function. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how we will use this rate function i to construct estimators for the uh, unknown performance function. So what we will do is um, we will construct what, what I call pessimistic and optimistic performance functions in the following way. So we will fix some realization theta prime of the least squares estimator. And then we construct the pessimistic performance function, capital JR, by um, calculating the maximum of the actual performance function functions over a ball centered at theta prime of radius r, where the ball is constructed with respect to this rate function i. And similarly, the optimistic performance function is obtained by replacing the maximum by a minimum. So now, because each system matrix theta corresponds to some probability or encodes some probability measure p theta, um, the pessimistic and optimistic performance functions here both have a distributionally robust interpretation. Now I'm going to use these pessimistic and optimistic performance functions to construct the proposed estimators. So we can, we can construct these estimators by evaluating the, um, the pessimistic and the optimistic uh, performance functions at the least squares at estimator theta hat t. Moreover, what we'll do is we will actually um, set the radius in these optimization problems to some baseline radius r divided by the square root of the sample size. So the radius will shrink as the sample size increases. So these are the proposed estimators. So what remains to be done now is I need to show to you that these two estimators satisfy all the three properties that uh, we were hoping they would satisfy. So that they provide upper and lower confidence bounds on the unknown true um, performance function, that they're asymptotically consistent at, and that they can actually be computed efficiently. So first, I would like to establish a simple out-of-sample guarantee. So we can prove that the true performance function, uh, j of theta, which is not known, falls outside of the interval between the proposed estimators with a probability that decays exponentially at rate r. Put differently, this means that the two estimators form asymptotically a confidence interval for, uh, j of, uh, that covers j of theta with high probability of 1 minus e to the minus r times square root of t. And here the decay rate r um, is the exact same r that was used as the baseline radius in the construction of these two estimators. Okay, so I do not have time to show you the proof, but I would like to point out that the proof of this theorem um, critically lies on the transformed, on the fact that the transformed least squares estimators satisfy a moderate deviations principle with rate function i. I should also point out that the proof is reminiscent, but not uh, more, uh, but, but actually more complicated than some similar result that was proved in, in this paper here. Okay, so that's for out of sample guarantees. Now let's look at asymptotic guarantees. So we can prove that the two estimators converge almost surely to the unknown true performance function. And this is maybe not so surprising and that I, can, I can give you the uh, proof idea. So it's known that these squares estimators are asymptotically consistent. So the theta hat t will converge almost surely to the true unknown theta. And it's also not difficult to show that these pessimistic and optimistic performance functions, uh, they will converge to the actual performance function evaluated at the center of the ball if the radius of the ball uh, shrinks. And the result of the, the theorem basically just follows by combining these two insights together. So there are some technicalities, but on a high level, this is not so difficult. What remains to be seen is whether uh, these estimators that we propose can actually be computed efficiently. So what I would like to do now, therefore, is I'd like to study the complexity of evaluating the pessimistic and optimistic performance function. So the, basically the, the complexity of evaluating the underlying distributionally robust optimization problems. For ease of exposition, I will only focus on the pessimistic performance function uh, shown here. 
So we should actually expect that evaluating this performance function is computationally challenging um, for, follow, for the following reasons. So first, the set capital theta of stable matrices over which we optimize is non-convex, unbounded, and open. Also, the uh, typical performance functions, say of theta, that we're interested in are uh, typically non-convex. So that's certainly true for the asymptotic uh, state variants, as, we, as we've seen before. And last but not least, also the rate function, uh, which is a constraint function of this problem, is non-convex in, in the optimization variable theta. So this maximization problem, uh, therefore, appears to be severely intractable. To make it tractable, I will make one assumption that is restrictive, but not two. So I will assume that the performance function j of theta can be represented as the trace of some positive definite matrix Q multiplied by the invariant uh, state covariance matrix S theta. So that's the same matrix that appears in the definition of the rate function. Now this assumption is restrictive, but um, examples of performance functions that uh, satisfy this assumption are the long run average cost that we've seen before, and also actually the, 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 the asymptotic state variance. And there are other interesting examples. So under this assumption, we are able to uh, show the following things. So actually to show computational tractability of this problem, I will proceed in two steps. First, one can show that the rate constraint here is binding for every radius r. And one can then show that the pessimistic distribution robust optimization problem shown here is equivalent to an unconstrained optimization problem um, their violations of the rate constraint are penalized in the objective function. And it's actually convenient to express the penalty fa um, factor as a fraction one over delta, where delta is a non-decreasing uh, function of the uh, radius r that saturates as r tends to infinity. So this is an exact constraint relaxation uh, result that has the flavor of a strong duality uh, result, but it's perhaps surprising because all the functions involved here are non-convex. So nevertheless, uh, this relaxation is exact. So from now on, we can therefore completely focus on this unconstrained problem and try to solve this one. Okay, so in the second step, um, we're going to use the formula for the rate function and the assumption about the performance function j from before. In this case, we can show that the, the, the unconstrained uh, problem at the top here is equivalent to a generalized LQR problem, the problem shown here at the bottom of the slide. And in fact, uh, the equivalence follows more or less directly from our knowledge that uh, LQR problems are solved by linear feedback controllers. So in the problem at the bottom, we do not restrict the controllers, the control actions, y to be linear functions of xt. But we know that because the objective is quadratic and the constraints linear, is, we know that linear controllers are optimal. And this problem at the top can be interpreted as one that optimizes only over linear controllers. So they're equivalent. Now, what's the benefit of that? The benefit of that is that uh, finally, the equivalent LQR problem here can be solved exactly by dynamic programming. So, and here we exploit the convenient fact that all value functions that emerge in these calculations uh, remain quadratic in the state. Okay, so the solution of the pessimistic distribution robust optimization problem uh, can therefore be described uh, as shown in this theorem. So we can prove that the optimal value of this pessimistic problem is given by the trace of some matrix, um, so noise covariance matrix multiplied by some matrix PR plus R over delta, where the matrix PR is the unique solution of the Riccati equation shown here. Now this PR can be viewed as the Hessian matrix of the value function in the stationary regime for the LQR problem from the previous slide. So this matrix PR also appears in an explicit formula for the worst case system matrix that attains the maximum in the original uh, pessimistic DRO problem. So that means this problem can be solved completely analytically, except that 
we would need to know the value of this function delta of r. However, even though, even though this function delta of r is not precisely known to us, we can use an efficient bisection algorithm to compute delta r to any desired precision. And in each iteration of this uh, bisection, we need to solve um, such a Riccati equation, but this is again easy. This could be done uh, naively by using value iteration, or it could be done differently by reinterpreting this Riccati equation as a generalized eigenvalue problem, which has uh, numerical, better, better numerical properties. So, so this is how we solve this problem. And all the involved steps are uh, very simple and therefore this problem is actually highly computationally tractable. And a very similar, actually even a simpler uh, procedure uh, can be used to solve the optimistic DRO problem that leads to the lower confidence bound estimator. Okay, so now that's the, that's the theory. And um, to actually showcase the, you know, the, the possible applications of this, let's take another look at the example that we studied before. So the example of controlling the Hubble Space Telescope. So we discussed that the main quantity of interest um, here is actually the, uh, the asymptotic state covariance matrix. So this S theta, right? And the reason for that is that this matrix uh, actually captures the degree of the vibrations uh, that are exerted on the, the telescope under the applied control. So we assume that for the telescope not to be damaged, this um, covariance matrix needs to be smaller than some upper bound, bound uh, over line S. Uh, this equal needs to hold in a positive semi-definite sense. Okay, so we do not know the exact asymptotic uh, state covariance matrix because we do not know the uh, system matrix theta that corresponds to our controller. So we need to estimate this. Actually, what we need to do is we need to decide whether this inequality is satisfied or not by using some data-driven decision rule. So the decision rule that we propose is the following one. So we're going to use the data, our observations of the state over t periods, and then construct some estimator theta hat star. I don't yet tell you how we do that, just assume we found some estimator, and then we calculate the asymptotic state covariance matrix pretending that the true system matrix is equal to this, to this estimator. And then we check whether uh, this estimated asymptotic covariance matrix it satisfies the safety constraints or not. So if it does not satisfy the safety constraints, then we abort the current active control law uh, and otherwise we continue. Okay, so this is what, what we're going to do. So as we are not calculating the exact state covariance matrix, but only an estimator based on uh, T state observations, we can actually make two types of errors. So the type one error is to abort, um, even if the control is actually safe. And the type two error is to continue applying the controller, even though um, this controller actually is unsafe and leads to damage. So we denote the probabilities of the type one and type two errors by alpha t and beta t here. Now, in case we make a type one error, that means we, we discontinue the control law that, that directs the telescope in the de desired direction. And that actually means that we jeopardize our ultimate objective without any need because the, actually the, the controller was safe. In case of a type two error, we continue to apply the control law, even though it is unsafe. And that means we, um, we may actually damage the, the telescope. So arguably in this example, a type two error is worse than a type one error. Now, um, by using the theory that we developed, we can actually prove the following theorem. So let's assume that the estimator theta hat star that we use in our decision rule is um, a maximizer of the worst case distribution robust optimization problem where the uncertainty set is centered at the least squares estimator. Okay, and, and note that this, this maximizer can be computed efficiently by what we've just seen. If you use this estimator in this decision rule, then we can prove that the type two error probability beta 
t decays exponentially at the rate r, which is the radius of the ball that we used here in the construction of this estimator. So then we're guaranteed that this type 2 error probability decays exponentially. Interestingly, there is a symmetric argument. So actually, if we construct the estimator differently, and if we use the optimistic ERO problem, where we minimize uh, over this rate ball instead of maximizing, and we plug this estimator into the decision rule, then we can prove that the type 1 error probability alpha t decays exponentially at rate r. Okay, I can show you how we, you how we prove this, but we use the, the, the theory that I've shown you, the model deviations uh, based uh, confidence balance. Okay, so here is actually an, another um, application of the, the methods that we develop. And it turns out that the techniques developed in this talk, they can they also, also offer an efficient method to project an unstable matrix to the set of stable matrices. This may actually be useful because the least squares estimator, theta hat, that we've used throughout the talk, may have realizations or may have some realization theta prime that falls outside of the set theta, capital theta of uh, stable system matrices. So it violates actually some prior knowledge that we have about uh, the true system matrix. So that means that this estimator is not particularly good. And in this case, uh, one might actually try to improve the least squares estimator by mapping it to the closest point in the set theta of stable matrices. So you'd like to project it onto theta. Now this seems hard because the set theta is unbounded and, and non-convex. Okay, so what can we do? Well, instead of using the Euclidean distance for projecting, what we propose is to use the rate function i from the moderate deviations principle as a distance measure for projecting theta prime onto the set capital theta of stable matrices. And we call the projection with respect to this distance function i um, the reverse i projection. The reason for that is that um, theta prime is the first argument in the i function, which is the one that we fix, and uh, the I function is not symmetric. So this is the reverse um, I projection because we fixed the first argument in this non-symmetric I function. So this is just uh, consistent with terminology that has been used in similar contexts. Okay. So as the rate function tends to infinity, as the second argument theta uh, approaches the boundary of the set of stable matrices, for this reason, and somewhat counterintuitively, I would say, the reverse I projection uh, is never on the boundary of the set theta, but actually somewhere in the interior. So that's just something that we should keep in mind. Okay. So before, going to, before I'm discussing the computational issues, before actually showing you that this reverse I projection can be computed efficiently, um, I would like to take a look at the improved estimator that we obtain by projecting the least squares estimator, theta hat t, onto the set of stable matrices. Okay, so that's the reverse I projection of the least squares estimator. This estimator respects our structural information that the true system matrix must be stable, and therefore, conceptually, it should be preferable to the least squares estimator. So what I would like to show now is that we can actually also bound the Euclidean error of this estimator with high probability, which is a nice feature of this, this estimator. Okay, so in this theorem here, um, what we're actually saying that the Euclidean distance between this new estimator to the unknown um, system matrix that we would like to estimate, so the Euclidean error, um, is smaller than some quantity that is observable and efficiently computable uh, with high probability one minus beta for any prescribed beta. So the quantity appearing here um, depends on this r hat, which is actually the distance between um, the least squares estimator and the set of stable matrices. And it also depends on the condition number of the noise covariance matrix. And actually, all, both of these quantities can be computed efficiently, as I'm going to show. 
So this refined least squares estimator uh, therefore offers explicit performance guarantees, which is a very nice feature. Okay, so what remains to be done, I need to explain to you why the reverse I projection is easy to compute. So I need to argue why it is easy to compute theta prime to the closest point, uh, theta star of theta prime inside the set of stable matrices with respect to this I function. And um, to show this, I'm going to denote by R underline the distance between theta prime and the set of stable matrices. Now, clearly, any minimizer of this problem is a reverse I projection of theta prime, because any minimizer is a point that is closest to theta prime. So now I can formulate, I can look at my optimistic distributional robust optimization problem from before, where I minimize some performance function over a rate pool, but I set the radius now to this R underline. So that means all the feasible solutions of this problem are reverse I projections. So this is actually the, the smallest possible non empty feasible set. And actually, in particular, the optimal solution of this problem is also a reverse I projection. So I can construct my reverse I projection by solving this optimistic distribution robust optimization problem for this particular radius. Now, it turns out that um, because this problem is easy to solve, and we can solve, um, we can find this reverse I projection by just solving one single simple Riccati equation. Again, unfortunately, I cannot go into the details because of lack of time. Uh, however, this can be done with just one line of MATLAB code. So this is super efficient. It can be done for very high dimensions. Okay, so projecting onto the set of, of, of stable matrices could be potentially easy if we use the right distance measure to do that. So I'm almost at the end of, almost at the end of my talk, but I would like to show one numerical experiment very simple one where we have a three-dimensional state and, and where the noise is, is normally distributed, standard normally distributed. Okay, so let's assume that the, the true system matrix, which, which we do not assume to know, is uh, given by this matrix here. In fact, if you do some, some math, you can calculate the eigenvalues of this matrix and you will find that one eigenvalue is real, 0 0.9, and the other two eigenvalues are, are complex, so 0 0.95 plus minus imaginary unit times 0 0.1. So the absolute values of all these eigenvalues are strictly smaller than one, and therefore this matrix is, is stable. Okay. So we now use um, this the linear system generated by this theta to generate ra random, uh, random state trajectory with 25 state observations. And we use this data to construct three different estimators for this matrix, which we, which we do not know, right? which we assume we do not know. So the first estimator is just the usual least squares estimator. And the second one is some estimator that has been proposed by uh, Boots, Gordon, and Siddiqui in some paper in Europe in 2008. So they basically uh, compute uh, some estimator by solving a um, rather complicated uh, constraint generation uh, by running some rather complicated uh, uh, constraint generation algorithm. And the last estimate we're going to test is the, the one that we propose, the reverse I projection of the naive least squares estimate. So we now consider 50 independent simulation runs, and we compute first the Euclidean error of the three estimators uh, in all three, in all simulation runs. So the left chart here shows that all estimators display a very similar performance in, in this regard. The, the two norm errors are very, very similar for the three estimators. However, the, le um, the right chart here shows that the eigenvalues of the esti um, estimators in the complex plane, they look rather different. So actually first, the white stars here they represent the true eigenvalues of the true system matrix, which we do not know. Okay. And now the, the red ROMs, they represent the eigenvalues of the least squares estimator. And as expected, uh, these eigenvalues often fall outside of the complex unit circle. So that means their absolute values are bigger than one. And that means that they correspond to estimators which are not stable. The blue ROMs here, 
they visualize the uh, eigenvalues of the constraint generation estimator of this uh, neural paper. So even though this estimator aims to um, estimate a stable matrix, the algorithm fails from time to time, and the eigenvalues fall outside of the complex unit circle in, in, a, in a number of simulation runs, and therefore actually result in, in unstable estimators. And finally, the green ROMs, um, shown here, they correspond to the reverse I projection, so the estimator we propose, and uh, you can see that uh, by construction, they all reside within the complex unit circle. So the estimator is guaranteed to be stable, and they actually quite nicely concentrate around the positions of the true eigenvalues. Okay, so this is uh, the example I wanted to show you. Now, um, this actually brings me to the end of this talk. So the material that I presented is uh, basically um, from this paper with my uh, co-authors and this is a working paper which uh, uh, should actually be available soon. Okay, so I would like to thank you very much for, uh, for uh, listening in and uh, be happy to, to answer questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for this wonderful talk. And so now we are open to questions and um, you can write your questions in the uh, chat and or unmute and ask it uh, as well. And when you're sending it through the chat, please uh, send it to everybody. Uh, I don't know, uh, Daniel, maybe sometimes it has happened in the past that they would send only to the speaker. Yeah, I don't think it has happened. Okay. Questions. Uh, Eric uh, raised uh, his hand. So, Eric, you want to? Hi. Go ahead. Yeah, I didn't know where to write my question. Um, <laughs> so, in the Hubble telescope example, you say you only have one shot at applying the right controller. And to me, uh, it seems that what you're trying, what you would like to estimate is the conditional expected uh, deviation after having seen the, the trajectory. Well, what you're estimating right now is the a priori uh, expected deviation. Can you comment a bit on this? Or? So basically, well, they will be, we're concerned about these vibrations, right? <clears throat> and um, it has been argued that the good measure for these vibrations is the the covariance matrix of the state. So that's the variances of the, the angle and the, the angular velocity of this of this uh, of the telescope. And and we're yeah we're using so we're observing um, a certain number of, of, of states, uh, a certain sampling rate. It's probably of the order of minutes. I would imagine. I'm not a specialist for, for, for this particular application. I should say. And uh, <clears throat> we would then uh, uh, well try to estimate. This covariance matrix, and uh, and then we need to make to take a decision whether we, we feel that the, the telescope is in danger, and, and if it is, then we should stop applying the controller that led to these vibrations, and, and if we think uh, it's safe, then we can continue. But what, what we're worried about, we do not want to make an error, and uh, therefore we want to err on the side of caution, and we would rather um, we would rather overestimate the the tag two error, the one that leads to damage. Uh, what I'm wondering is if uh, you're looking for the conditional covariance matrix, given that you have observed trajectory, or you're interested in the covariance matrix without having uh, observed the trajectory, or whether the two are the same because of some independence assumption. So, so I, I am basically here. So we have an estimator. That estimator is, is, is constructed from, I've observed T states, and then I construct it. Right? Mm -hmm. Then I need to make a decision. Yeah. But the, the states that are observed, they follow this autoregressive process, so they're serially correlated. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, 
Um, a similar to that around the question, but uh, please feel free to call, to insist. <laughs> So we have a question from Alex Shapiro. Why were you interested in the unstable case? Was this suggested by the data? Daniel, uh, maybe I'll uh, Yeah, please go ahead. First of all, very nice talk, thank you. Uh, so my question is why really you need to look all this when it is so close to be unstable? It was because of the data that you observed? Uh, well, we, we don't know. We don't know where where it is. I mean, we we assume that we have access to a controller which is stable. So so we assume that the, the system will not be destroyed because if it's unstable, there is nothing. There is really nothing we can do. But as long as if it's stable, we don't know. The assumption is that we don't know where the system matrix is, and if you're unlucky, it's close to the boundary of uh, of the set of stable matrices. And uh, then we need to be very cautious. If it's if it's very much in the in the interior of the set, then uh, we may be safer. Uh, the, the, the problem is we don't, we don't know where we are. If you had the data, you estimate it, and you can see if it is close or not. Uh, yes, that is that is true, right? <clears throat> and uh, so did you, that's what you did do you here. Have... here we're basically checking uh, an upper bound on the on the on the, the state covariance matrix, right? This one would. If, if the matrix theta is unstable, this one would have an eigenvalue that would blow up. So, so this would not exist. Um, and we can check what we have developed here is essentially a hypothesis test um, for correlated data. And this allows us to test whether uh, our matrix is below this given uh, uh, threshold. And, and, and if it is, then we're guaranteed that we're stable. And we, we can say, well, that this will happen with a certain confidence. That's what the I guess the theorem here says, right? It tells us how this error probability decays. Sorry, Daniel. Uh, again, you uh, worked with real project and this was the problem or, not? or it was more like theoretical? No, this is a theoretical project and this is a very stylized, uh, very stylized. Uh, Sorry? Hmm? This is a stylized, uh, this is a stylized example, which is motivated by, uh, by a real problem. There is a paper that describes uh, the, the problems with vibrations of the Hubble Space Telescope, and we, uh, we used it as an example. But this is a theoretical, uh, theoretical work, which has, uh, uh, I guess, a number of theoretical results that, that are related, some of them to control, but others may be of interest in, in other domains. Like, like here, just finding a projection of some matrix on the set of stable matrices that could potentially have applications in very different domains. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we have a next question from Paritosh. Uh, is it possible to obtain stable matrices using your approach of pessimistic and optimistic functions, even if the data is not correlated? Um, yes, so if the data is not correlated, then uh, well, basically that would mean the system matrix is zero, zero right? Because the, we have this autoregressive process. Um, the, the, the term that links um, the state of time t plus one to the state of time t is, is the theta. If the theta is zero, then actually uh, our state is just equal to the noise. And the noise is assumed to be IID. I should have maybe pointed it out more clearly. And then we would just observe an IID sequence. Um, of course, our approach would then, um, we would, would then we would then be able to estimate some function of, of white noise. And uh, that could be of interest on, on its own right, but it's more like what, what classically has been all of, most of classical statistics looks, looks at IID data. There is, there is much more literature that looks at IID data. And this would be a special case of, of this approach if the, if the theta is zero. So we could still get confidence bounds. The theory would still go through, but it uh, would probably be not necessary to to look at these the tools that we that we that we uh, use here. Okay, so next one is uh, from Vajan, and uh, it says a uh, very nice talk. Uh, is it possible to bounce some of both types of errors? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I I do not know of a nice formula that allows us to do both at the same time. So we have these two estimators and. 
depending on which one we use, we, we have a guarantee on, on one of the errors, but we do not have a formula that gives us a guarantee on both of them at the same time. And of course, uh, you could probably try to use some, some Monferroni type argument and combine the two together, but that would maybe be a, uh, maybe that's not what you're asking, so that may be not too sophisticated. So I imagine that you could somehow combine them. If both of them are small, then you separately, then uh, uh, you can also argue that they're, they're both small jointly, um, but I don't have an, an elegant, uh, uh, simple answer. Not like that. Okay, um, next talk is from Bernardo Costa. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for the very nice talk. Uh, would it be reasonable and feasible to design the controller given theta so that it remains safely inside the stable region? say with largest eigenvalues smaller than 0.9, may this be an approach if A and B change slightly over time, for example? Yes, so, so this is of course, uh, this is a very good question, of course. And I mean, what reinforcement learning tries to do, or uh, some people call it model-free uh, control, is when you don't know A and B, you, you try to learn A and B and at the same time design a controller that, that, that optimizes some performance function at the same time. And what we've done here is, is definitely more modest. We basically, we fix the controller and try to, to decide whether this controller satis or whether the, the performance of that controller um, uh, satisfies certain, certain constraints or be belongs to some confidence set with high probability. And that's what I said at the beginning that we view this, so, so we think that we have rigorous results in this, in this, in, in this case. I, I should, should emphasize they're asymptotic, they're not finite sample. But the, the formulas that are involved, I think, are, are nice. And it's a general framework that we think should also be generalizable to, to, more, uh, to other uh, kinds of, of stochastic processes, not just uh, autoregressive processes uh, of first order, but, but others, hopefully, maybe even nonlinear ones. And um, so we hope that this would be eventually a building block of uh, some rigorous reinforcement learning algorithm which does the optimization of the controller at the same time. Um, but at this point, we, we do not have uh, strong results in, in, in this regard. So uh, I think that's uh, a very interesting uh, future research direction to, to look at that. And, and you're right, so if, if A and B change over time, then uh, uh, this is pertinent. This is, uh, so that would mean that the theta changes over time. And that would reinforce so one would have probably have uh, had, uh, need some 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 understanding of on what time scales the, the theta can change, and that would mean that the data that you can actually use with that approach would also be would only be useful uh, as long as the, the theta remains stable. So, in that sense, actually, what we're doing, where we say that we only have a, a finite state history uh, state history that we can use, uh, is certainly even more valid. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Thank you. <clears throat> Bernard also says thank you. Um, all right, so uh, if there are no other questions, let me also check if there is anybody who also raised hand or want to unmute themselves and ask the question. I do not see any. All right, so uh, thanks, Daniel, again, for this wonderful talk, as usual. Uh, very nice uh, work. Thank you very much for, again, for inviting me. It was a, it was a great pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I just... Some, some real conference uh, sometime again. To, to I, yeah, really yeah. hope to have a real conference at some point. Um, so our colleagues in Venice uh, have decided they're going to go ahead and uh, do the conference in uh, Venice next year, the next summer, 2021, so hopefully. So I just want to end by uh, announcing our next talk. Um, we have um, Dave Morton, uh, two weeks from now, right? Again, Friday, same time. Uh, sorry for those on the Pacific uh, time or in Singapore. Um, it's hard to get everybody, uh, but this is a time that works the best. So our next speaker will be David Morton from Northwestern University. And he will be talking about uh, actually some chance constraint, uh, you know, um, 
programming for some real world uh, application that is actually being used by uh, some of the states uh, in the US. So um, about COVID-19, how to relax social distancing if you must. Um, so, and uh, I hope to see every one of you there as well. And thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> I am going to stop the recording.